Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about the value of uh, ethnography in public health, in uh, planning targeted interventions, and in uh, the social sector more generally. Um, Ravi, you've actually commissioned us happily to do this kind of ethnography, so maybe you'd like to kick off and tell us what was on your mind. Why did you think this was important? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So, you know, when we started uh, this program, which is there in 1,000 villages in uh, Maharashtra, in Nandurbar and in Amravati. So we were looking into the secondary data which was all available. But what was lacking was like the insights, what's happening with the tribal populations, how, how the migration actually impacts the nutrition status. What's happening uh, with, the, with the data? Is the data right? Is the data wrong? There was a publication which came up from the Gates Foundation uh, during their Avan program which was use it or lose it. That inspired us actually. We thought like, you know, let's, let's do the deep dive into the data sets and let's see something like, you know, uh, what's happening to the cultures? So what are the social norms? Uh, uh, is there a problem with the norms? Is there a problem with the so social stratification? Is there is a culture itself which has some issues or, uh, or some, you know, and other things like which nudge will work? Will the audio nudge will work? Will the or, or the video nudge will work? Or what nudges we should work on if we have to really change the situation in the thousand villages which we have adopted? That helped us to understand, like you know, uh, it's good to do the baseline surveys, end line surveys, and all kind of researches which are available. It's more to spend time on understanding the ethnography, and also to invest heavily on ethnography as well as on the anthropological data sets to understand the things. That's, that's the very beginning of, uh, you know, our, our discussions. So when we started, like, people did ask us, like, you know, you get the Nel Nielsen data for doing your marketing jobs, and you get a lot of data from the, you know, district level health surveys, and why you are commissioning, why you are spending so much money on this? We said, because we don't know the problem. And there comes, you know, the role of Vihara as an organization. And over to you. Yeah, uh, you, you know, just in another conversation the other day uh, with a development uh, expert, we had a big discussion about incentives, right? And, you know, a lot of people in this room are aware that if you're a prime in an organization, in a program, and we've played that role ourselves, here you get $3.2 million for five years, and as long as you keep checking boxes, as long as you keep turning in your files every year, you will keep getting that money. Whether you make any change on the ground at all, there's no really control on that. And if, it, if you didn't achieve any delta, well, oh well, you know, you may not get a follow-on grant, but you tried. Nobody can penalize you, nobody can take that money away from you. And there's a real you know, problem with incentives, it seems to me, globally in the development space, um, because people aren't really committed to achieving outcomes. The minute you actually care about outcomes, you will find that you just don't know enough to take decisions. Now that is a problem, you know, that it's flipped around in the private sector. In the private sector, people are evaluated continuously on the basis of their outcomes, and if they don't know their markets, then they know they're going to feel the heat, and they're going to be out of this organization, out of this position in two years' time. They need to perform. So the pressure to really know what's going on is different in the private sector. So, so I mean, this is one um, opportunity that we've had with the Nutrition India program um, to actually come in very early on and provide um, a, a kind of snapshot of the society that we're trying to, 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 to intervene into. Um, I want to use another couple of metaphors, if, if you'll allow me. Um, you know, my dad is in and out of hospitals these days, um, and I have to spend time uh, you know, with him in the hospital sometimes. And he's got Hajar imaging stuff happening to him, right? He's getting MRIs and ultrasounds and x-rays. And well, why is that? I mean, that's because people have to make sound decisions about this man's body. And they can't really see inside his body. So they need to triangulate around what's happening inside of his body. Um, and, and those of us in the development sector presumably are also exercising kinds of surgery into the body socius, right, the, the collective social body, we are attempting to make changes happen. It's a grave responsibility. If we're flying blind and we don't really know what the conditions on the ground are, the odds of us making positive change are very, very, like, limited, and the odds of us making the opposite of positive change very high. 
So we took some very, uh, you know, informed decisions through the ethnographic study. Uh, what is the design of the program? So the design of the program, like, you know, uh, generally what happens is you sign the check, you ask to the organizations who are partnering with you, uh, okay, so how many people you have reached, how many kids' life you have saved. When you ask about the deeper questions on what is the dailies generated, which is disability adjusted life years, there are very few answers to that. You ask them, when you ask them for a promise, the promise is basically, uh, it just works like the development impact bond. Okay, in the, in the year one, I need wasting to be reduced by 20% in the total universe. So how you will do it? If you don't know, like moms are not there for 60% of the time. Second thing, but, but came out from the research very clearly, which is also a very good learning for us is the palatability of food. Women say, okay, so I have the local things available here for eating, but I, during pregnancy, I want to eat something very different. Uh, this is not very palatable. Can someone guide me? So what is to be made? So we, t we tell them like, you know, okay, uh, we have the 40 uh, community nutrition and uh, breastfeeding volunteers on ground. Big question came to us, they themselves don't know. What is to be made? How, how the food is to be made more palatable? Because mood changes, a lot of hormone changes in the woman's body during pregnancy. So we, we started working towards that. And this insight also came from the research. You can't feed daily same thing to the woman. Third insight which came from the research was the color of the food in the, in the thali or in the plate. So the color of the food also like uh, when, when we were doing the mapping of the food, mainly two or three ingredients were coming, you know, the brown color was coming, which was for the ragi and for the wheat. White color was totally missing. Green color was there to some extent. And in most of the families which we were actually doing the studies with, they said like, you know, uh, we are told as per our, our local, you know, customs and religion, once you actually, you know, deliver a child, for five months period, you need not to take anything which is white in color. We were shocked to see this thing, like, you know, how is, is it possible in this, uh, you know, in, in, in this life now? Because things are changing using the data, technology and all that. So this is something which actually came. Then there was a huge difference in uh, the health vocabulary of the community and the health vocabulary of the doctors. So when, when the patients or when the, when the moms were taking the kids to the doctors, so they were not able to explain to them like, you know, what is the actual problem. And doctors, they come from the urban parts, semi-urban parts. So building a common dictionary. So over to you, Aditya, to put light on this. Um, yeah, there are a couple of uh, things I'd like to touch on. Um, you know, the question that often is asked is, why isn't it that our own frontline can tell us about the community? Why do we need specialists like you and your people trained wherever, it, you know, JNU, etc., to come in and tell us something about the community? Um, the reason is that, you know, every value chain is really focused on what they're peddling. They're not necessarily focused on the people they're trying to serve. And even if they are, people fall in and out of their optic, right? So doctors experience patients for just a few seconds or minutes. And then as they cease to present symptoms, in a sense, they are no longer interesting objects. They are not patients at all. So how do you follow the gaze of people who are sometimes patients, are sometimes not patients, into their homes and understand the kinds of risks that they experience when they're not at a public health facility? Um, this is the kind of question that I, you know, invite all of us in the public health space to really ruminate on and, and think a little bit about. Around this particular project, there's, there's one point related to service delivery that I also want to share. Very early on when our teams visited uh, these two tribally dominated districts on the edge of Maharashtra, we realized a very peculiar pattern of migration, peculiar to us anyway, which is that they were crossing the borders into Madhya Pradesh in one direction and into Gujarat in the other direction. So in a way, the malnutrition and the severest challenges they faced is in that period when they are on the road. And th these communities are traveling, all able-bodied people are traveling at the same time. Uh, wives and children are, are moving along with able-bodied men uh, into the uh, other district for sharecropping and for other kinds of economic activities. And that's a period in which suddenly their infrastructure cra crashes, uh, the access to quality food crashes, uh, and they're in suddenly extreme distress. And then they come back, and they're in my bounty again. So there's an pa ongoing pattern in their lives of abundance and scarcity. Now, when you're on the Maharashtra side, you only ever encounter them in their abundance, and you never follow them across the border into what happens while they're on the road. 
And this is a fundamental problem of the service delivery architecture. This isn't really designed to cross multiple polygons. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is an old insight for people who've worked with uh, groups on the edges of borders. Uh, but it's the kind of, um, you know, rethinking that we can, we can offer when we look at the, uh, the deep structure of people's lives and the, and the patterns that organize them. Thank you. Uh, in the end, would like to thank uh, Chief Minister Maharashtra and all the partners who are working with us. They have given us an opportunity to work together and to explore newer ways of doing the work. Uh, during the breaks, we'll be available. We'll be uh, discussing more about the blockchain and other things, how we are validating the results through the blockchain of our work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.